all know now why we elected not to have the retractable roof option on our new concert hall. One of the wettest days of the year couldn't dampen the spirits of hundreds of people who gathered in April 1996 to break ground for the new home of the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. It is a momentous day, a momentous occasion for all of us. We realize that in some ways and in some wonderful ways, our city will never be the same again. After the defeat of a public bond issue that would have financed a new auditorium, a Seattle family stepped forward with a huge gift, putting the project back in motion. The remarkable lead gift of $15 million made by the Benaroya Foundation gave life to our campaign, and we've named our new home for this remarkable family. The city swung into action, and so did local foundations and corporate and private donors. The orchestra's dream suddenly became very real. And there was the sense, I think, in the community that the Seattle Symphony had waited its turn. Other groups had gotten their buildings and their facilities built, and the time was now. <laughs> There were those who asked, why build a new hall at all? The Opera House, the orchestra's home since 1962, was large and a well-known venue for music. For a city like ours to have one facility is, is really a little strange, actually. There was virtual gridlock in the Seattle Opera House because of the numbers of performances scheduled. Not being able to have visiting ensembles joining us not being able to rehearse on the stage, not being able to play on weekends, not being able to expand our season. In the previous 10 years, the symphony had looked at a variety of sites for a new home. They considered buying and renovating historic theaters. There was a plan to stay at Seattle Center, which had long been the city's arts campus, and build right across the street from the existing opera house. The Seattle Center needed museums, it needed daytime uses, but it didn't need any more nighttime uses. The parking is a challenge, and, it, and it, to expand beyond its borders really didn't make sense to keep pushing the edge into the neighborhood. Finding an unused plot of land downtown was a major breakthrough. But the location presented a whole new set of engineering challenges. Being downtown Seattle was surrounded by uh, busy streets, sirens, a lot of traffic noise. Um, but uh, added to that is a situation where we have a uh, metro bus tunnel running alongside 3rd Avenue, which is in, in the near future is going to have light rail running through it, which tends to put more vibration into the ground. And then uh, to cap it all, we have uh, beneath the building itself, about 14 feet beneath the parking garage, is a Burlington Northern Twin Track Railroad Tunnel, uh, which has something like 35 trains a day going through it. The primary way to isolate the building foundation from other vibrations was to use thick, hard rubber bearings at crucial joints. This bearing takes the vibration that is vertical uh, in relationship to the rest of the building. So if the sounds of the train are rumbling through below us and they're carrying a rumble into this beam, this bearing prevents it from being transmitted into this beam in which the auditorium floor rests on. The main auditorium is a giant box that floats inside the outer box of the main structure, another way to keep out interference. as we develop this window wall and the, the expression of those bay windows, yeah. both as a way to make the, the lantern expression of the lobby is also kind of reach out to the surrounding yeah. community. The symphony chose the Seattle firm of LMN Architects to design the building. The task was complex. 
a downtown concert hall would be a signature addition to the cityscape. The team had to find a design that would be timeless, have identifiable features, and still be functional and efficient in a busy downtown environment. And that at least in that model, that, are, that uh, study model starts to begin to show something uh, in, in that direction with the layering of the pieces of uh, tape. That was an overriding objective to make sure that we didn't get trapped in, in, in some uh, trite statement, but, but did things that were founded in, in the, 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 the rules, if you will, of, of good architecture. Proportion, color, massing. Uh, transparency, play, the play of all of those elements uh, uh, to, to, to create something that, that wasn't dated. Concert halls are not like almost anything else. They last forever. Great concert halls are 100 years old, 125 years old, 150 years old. This is a monument for the moment and for our future. This large building will help identify our city from now on. It's a very important moment in the history of our orchestra and then the history of our region. It's fantastic. Isn't it great? Do you get up? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right near, near the top now, you know. The question on everyone's mind, how will it sound? Will Benaroya Hall produce the kind of sound that it's supposed to? It is the million dollar question, or maybe it's the hundred million dollar question uh, of, of a project of this type. I have no uh, worries about this hall. I know it will sound fantastic. We just have to wait and see. I mean, that of course is always the huge question mark with, with new halls. Acoustics seem to fall somewhere between science and art. It isn't entirely predictable. Disappointing results are always a possibility. For instance, in 1980, the San Francisco Symphony built a sparkling new home. Louise Davies Hall was a modern, innovative design for a rounder auditorium. But after complaints about the acoustics by musicians and listeners alike, the hall was renovated at a cost of over ten million dollars. Now what they did was to cut off the sides so that it would became more rectangular and it greatly improved the hall. Well, you know, come on, you know, this, this was known uh, fifty years ago. Dr. Cyril Harris, the acoustical designer of Benaroya, designed the Kennedy Center and New York's Metropolitan Opera House and consulted on nearly 100 other auditoriums. I think Cyril is the uh, finest acoustician that I've ever known or known of. He's more knowledgeable, he's more exacting, more caring, extremely demanding, um, and a wonderful man to work with. And he's a traditionalist. Ben Arroyo Hall would have a narrow, rectangular, or shoebox shape. It's a shape that some of the world's oldest concert halls share, including Vienna's Grosser Musikvereinshall and Boston Symphony Hall. It tends to, by its nature, to help give more diffusion, promote the sound coming from all angles to your ears. Seattle's new auditorium is some 50 feet narrower than the old opera house. And unlike the opera house, it is designed specifically for an orchestra. The opera house is a multi-purpose facility, obviously. It has wings, it has a fly space above. There are no great halls in the world that are multi-purpose facilities. For example, 
in an opera house, ha half the sound is lost. Inside this rectangle are many other shapes. The walls and ceiling have many angles and bumps of different sizes. That's because a musical sound is only diffused or scattered when it strikes a surface size that corresponds to the size of its wave. Well, one of the things that diffusion does, it envelops you. When if you have very good diffusion in a hall, the sound seems to be coming at you from all directions. And if you don't have that, you lose it. A short wavelength or high-pitched sound will be scattered by coming in contact with a small bump or surface. The balcony face would be a good example of that. Notice that down at this end, it's only this wide. It gets wider, which means that at the, the, higher, the highest frequencies will be diffused from the small end. A longer wave, or a low-pitched sound, will only be diffused when it comes in contact with a large surface. The statuary and ornamentation in Boston Symphony Hall or the Hall in Vienna do the same thing that the angles do in Benaroya Hall. There are a variety of sizes, angles, corners, and surfaces that scatter sound. The entire ceiling uh, gives us excellent diffusion. And on the stage itself, we have the pipes. Those have been physically selected for that position to enable the musicians to uh, hear more of the sound on the stage. What the concert goer hears is only part of the acoustical story. What musicians hear or don't hear is critically important. The stage design is crafted to let the musicians hear one another well. The solid shell doesn't allow music to escape. The side panels diffuse sound to the musicians, and even the stage doors are massive and solid. While the opera house made the musicians work hard, the different environment in Benaroya Hall will require a new sound, a new way of playing. That's one of the scary things about moving to Benaroya, is because I think it's going to take us a while to refine our sound to a more grateful uh, auditorium. Everyone's going to have to learn to play not quite so hard, not push on the strings and not blow so much. I've announced it to the orchestra. I've made suggestions what they should do to prepare themselves for the tremendous change. It especially affe affects the winds and brass. They just have to learn how to play at a softer level. It's my dream. You created my dream, Cyril. Someone's here with us um, who's really the most responsible for having this happen, and that's Jack Benaroya. So, Jack. Very exciting moment, isn't it? God. How will the auditorium sound? Will it work? <laughs>